Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for this amazing webinar episode, Restrictions into Opportunities, How to Make Your Restaurant Succeed, brought to you by Restaurateur Connection and sponsored by Hunger Rush. This is the very first episode of our series. We've got a lot on our plates, and it's also the first episode we have on this website, Restaurateur Connection. So thank you all for supporting us for this first episode, and you're in for a great webinar. My name is Julie Lawson, the webinar coordinator for this episode, and I'm excited to bring you some hard-earned insights about running a restaurant in these crazy times. I'm really looking forward to interviewing and talking with our speaker. And if you miss any of today's episode, have no fear because this will be recorded. You can access the recording by clicking the link in the chat box, which will show up right about now. Before we go any further, I want to thank our sponsor, Hunger Rush. Hunger Rush is a scalable restaurant technology designed for stellar guest experiences. Hunger Rush offers a fully integrated restaurant management system that lets the restaurant own the relationship with their customer by mastering operational efficiency, creating awesome guest experiences with ease, and squeezing customer data for every drop of insight. The easy to use, highly configurable system includes digital ordering, loyalty and rewards, delivery management and support, takeout and curbside communications, no contact capabilities and reporting and management. Also, you can focus on doing what you love, serving great food. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Hunger Rush helps restaurants compete in the toughest business on earth. There are a ton of options. Loyalty is hard to get and preferences are changing fast. Their vision is to be the leading restaurant management system built to optimize customer engagement and effectiveness of operations. And their mission is to empower restaurants with technology that showcases and improves their guest experience. And I know restaurants need empowerment more than ever. So uh, thank you, Hunger Rush. On that note, please feel free to ask questions during today's session. Engagement from you guys is the key to a great webinar, so please don't be shy. You can do so by submitting them into the question panel on the right side of your screen. There will be a Q&A section throughout the webinar as well as at the end, so stay until the very end to hear even more fresh insights from Joe and Patrick. My lovely colleague Joe will be fielding your questions today. He'll be happy to answer any questions you might have so pull up the question panel and say hello to let him know that you're listening lastly if you have any audio issues during today's presentation you may choose to dial in by phone you can do so by selecting the more button in the upper right portion of your screen and then select the switch to phone option so today i'm talking to joe english and patrick cottrell after 26 years of selling food and liquor joe leveraged his experience to help those in the hospitality industry his passion for clients helps them every day in the success of their business, helping to create new jobs and opportunities for others. As a regional director at Sculpture Hospitality, he has taken on every challenge that comes his way with the same enthusiasm and energy that he delivers to his client base. Patrick is managing one of the fastest growing markets and operating multiple territories. He is constantly building and growing his team of franchises to ensure the success of restaurants across Florida while also tossing a little friendly competition amongst other franchises. Patrick comes from a strong hospitality background, spending most of his career at the executive level in both front of house and back of house positions. As a prior restaurant and bar owner, he understands the importance of keeping margins tight. So these guys really know what they're talking about, so we're in for a great episode. So without further ado, take it away, gentlemen. Thanks, Julie. Uh... I could probably speak for Patrick and I both. We're excited to be on the on the webinar with you, and uh, hopefully uh, our already on audience will be able to get some some nuggets out of what we have to to present. Um, just a few things. Uh, we we've got about four different topics, main topics that that Patrick and I are going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to dive into some planning and preparation, and you know we certainly know that uh, during these times uh, that is is certainly changing uh, we're also going to talk about simplifying the menu uh, things are very different than they were a year ago so we've got to take a look uh, at what we're offering to our clients uh, our customers and then also you know a new a new thing that's out there it was it was pre-covid but it's it's front and foremost now is structuring your to-go station we see a lot of uh, good opportunities in that 
area. And then staffing and, and retraining the staff uh, is, uh, is another key component as well as technology. So a lot of new technology coming into the play right now. And uh, so we'll spend a few minutes talking about that as well. Uh, so with that being said, uh, Patrick, what uh, should we jump right in and, and start to talk about planning and prep? Great. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Patrick Cottrell here. Thanks again for everybody uh, on this uh, webinar. And uh, as you go through, you know, the dynamics of what's going to happen next with your restaurant and preparing, uh, you know, here, here I'm from Florida. So Florida is pretty much open, but the other states that are out there, uh, we know that you guys are uh, struggling with your business right now. And one of the key things is understanding now how to maximize your profitability. And one of those is to plan and prepare um, effectively. It's, it's interesting as we talk to specific clients throughout our uh, you know, days and, and weeks when we're out in the field, uh, you know, as owners um, of restaurants and bars or hotels or what have you, you know, essentially what's happening is, is understanding where your money comes from is very, very crucial, especially coming back into the game of things. You know, you wanna look at, you know, how many chairs and tables you have. You know, do you have enough seating to achieve your financial goals? The idea is to understand how much money you could actually make with the seating and the facility that you currently have. So, you know, you want to look at your operational hours of conducting business. During those operational hours, are you filling all the seats with your patrons? You know, this is very, very crucial to see, like if you were just to draw out your, you know, your map or your seating chart, very often we can use technology uh, like open table out there or, or hunger rush to essentially dynamically change the, the platform of your restaurant with the seats but you can calculate how much money you can get from each uh, dining experience for time of service so breakfast lunch and dinner so on and so on you can easily track how this looks and plan to implement a strategy to fill those uh, those times especially the off time we'll talk a little bit about takeout but essentially, if your restaurant, bar, or facility, or cafe is not fully booked, you got to think about ways to draw those uh, particular patrons in. Um, evaluate your guest count. So look at your head count, see what their spending habits are, and in, in how long do they spend, you know, time in your establishment. Very often we see, you know, coffee houses where, uh, you know. This is a great spot to do work, you know, on the computer for sure. But are you really turning tables um, to make more more money? So in that type of establishment, you might want to look at ways to, uh, you know, think about maximizing profits in a different way, different upsellings. Um, are your guests only buying an appetizer, or are they also having a full meal? So you want to look at that because maybe your appetizers are too big. So everybody knows, yes, value is great, but if someone's coming in and only spending $12 on an appetizer and they're not moving on to an entree or a, a second appetizer, you know, you want to really look at those particular things. Um, understanding the type of guest that is visiting your restaurant, this is, this, is, this is pretty big because, you know, their spending habits and what they can spend right now is going to be crucial for, you know, planning and preparation. Um, then we can look at staffing, you know, so, uh, you know, are you staffed enough or, or too much? You know, so as an example, you know, I was at a restaurant uh, maybe uh, Saturday and they were understaffed. And, and I understand why, because there's different capacity levels with curfews. But if you're understaffed already, but you you can you can fulfill your seats, then the guest experience is not going to be there to satisfy your you know to satisfy your guests. You know, with one bad experience from a guest, it can really really hurt your business. So staffing is is you know crucial, but you also want to look at how you're spending that money. Uh, is it unnecessary, or you know do you have too much staff for business volume, or do you have to, uh, too little? So it's something that you really, really want to look at. By evaluating those four steps, you can calculate out to maximize your profitability. Looking at your tables, 
looking at your operational hours, analyze your guests and your staffing. If you put that in a matrix, plan it out just like a performa, you'll, you'll evaluate your business. You'll be shocked sometimes to see that you're not maximizing your profitability and or you could say, hey, you know, I could just do these little things in order to make an extra crunch of that cash flow that flows in. Joe, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, you know, Patrick, one of the things that you talked about was the, you know, really getting the butts in the seats throughout your open time. And, you know, here in my market, I've seen some people be very, uh, very proactive, some of, some of the restaurants, in terms of limiting the time that people actually have, um, in ter you know, might be an hour and 15 minutes or something like that before they're going to actually, you know, ask them to, to kind of wrap it up and, and, and move along. And honestly, in, in today's environment, I see the customers understanding that. They don't feel rushed out of it, but they, they understand, you know, they're there trying to help the customer, or the, the restaurant stay open by by providing them the the business and they understand because they know up front that they're gonna you know they maybe only have an hour and 15 minutes before the next uh turn on that table uh they're willing to 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 pack it up and go you know when the time comes because it's all part of just trying to support that restaurant so i think that you know those are types of things that uh you know pre-covid nobody would have ever you know considered uh that side of it but uh, this is certainly different times that we have to kind of approach. Yeah, that's great. Um, one of the other things to add is in, in, in hotels, one of the biggest reliance of knowing how their profitability is gonna be is on the occupancy rates, right? So if you look at how focused they are on occupancies throughout everything, so a hotel will, will gauge how much staff even in their restaurants or their bar they're, they're going to have by their occupancy rates right if if people aren't coming in uh, off the you know off the street so think about that as you move forward and you start to reopen your restaurants or maybe you're open think about that just in general with occupancy rate your restaurant your table your bar um, establishment cafe or whatever it may be everything has an occupancy rate so if you evaluate the same thing within your table matrix your your operational hours that's going to be the key so um hopefully uh, you guys got some good good nuggets out of that um i think we can move on to the next slide and if anyone has any questions and wants to chat in feel free we can uh try and uh answer any questions as we go so Patrick, I will say that you know we're, the next slide is is simplifying your menu, and you know I'm you're the expert here, so so I'm excited to hear what you have to say about some of these things as well. Great. Um, so this is interesting. I have a uh, chef background. I'm a chef by trade, but uh, you know worked my way through every level of the kitchen. So whether it be a dishwasher, I was peeling potatoes when I was 14 years old. Um, you know. Now looking at all of our clients and what we do on a consulting level, uh, pre-COVID and after COVID, we've seen some large menus out there. And when I say menus, um, we're talking books sometimes. And, and this that doesn't mean that it's a bad thing, but you know, one of the things that we're going to talk about in this particular section is cross-utilizing your ingredients you know, looking at your past purchases and think about those rather than purchasing things that aren't gonna sell. Um, what are your guests' favorites and using daily specials and then getting creative. You know, one of the biggest things that I see when I go into um, most restaurants and bars is that, you know, either they're running out or they have too much of something or their products are going bad or they're 86ing things, um, you know, if you ever wonder why your food products are spoiling uh, or you have to uh, throw them out, perhaps, you know, like a bottle of wine that, you know, you couldn't cross utilize for a sangria of some sort, you know, as owners, we often want to let our staff be creative. And that, that makes total sense, right? Especially in, you know, in a creative culinary world and or in the bar, especially with the um, crafty cocktails, 
we want our staff to be creative and, and our guest experience likes that as well. But you know, it's one of the things is to look at your menu in the perspective of a business owner of profitability. You know, if if you're focusing on your stars of those items that move, you know, this is where you're gonna really, really progress in financial uh, stability as you're opening up uh, after COVID. Um, look at cross utilizing ingredients. So I'll give you an example. If you have salmon on your menu as an entree, um, you know, don't just use salmon as an entree. You know, if you're buying whole salmon and you're breaking it down, make a ceviche out of it, um, you know, have a tartare on the menu, make a salmon burger, these type of things. You know, if you're bringing in a product, um, think about how many ways you can use it on your menu. It's interesting that you can take an item and be creative throughout the entire process of the menu from appetizers all the way to the desserts by utilizing um, specific menu items. For instance, if you, if you brought in, let's say fresh um, honey cubes, right? If, if that honey is only being used for your cheese plate, think about other ways. Maybe you can add an appetizer with it or uh, you know, charcuterie board and multiply and use it in ways that you can actually um, use it. In that case, that item is not going to spoil. But if you have, um, you know, fresh seafood, anything like that that's going to spoil, you might as well put it throughout, uh, you know, your menu cross utilizing it. Um, minimize the menu to your guest's favorite. So uh, probably everybody's been in to a chain restaurant recently where they've really, really shrunk down the menus. So what they're doing is they're looking at the last few years worth of volume and looking at their guest's favorite. They're going to keep those star items on the menu that they know that they're not only going to sell the most of, but they're also looking at the, uh, the food costs. So it's the same thing on the beverage side. If something costs, uh, you know, 50% margins or such, or your margins are too high, we're not talking about lowering quality, but we're also, we're, we're talking about, you know, having the items that are going to sell the most that are going to make you the most money. That's the idea, you know, that's what you're looking at. So when you're looking to narrow down your menu, look at the items that are gonna sell out. So if not, uh, bring in specials, you know, let your chefs be creative, but bring in specials that you know that are gonna sell out within that perishable date. So if, if a fresh seafood item has three days, you know, run the special for three days, don't run it every day, or run a special for the entire month so then that way, every time that you're bringing it in, you're, you're selling out. Chances are, you know, unless you have a regular that comes in every week, you know, you'll have a flow of clientele that comes in. You're going to see the special and it's going to be special to them because they were in last month. So look at, look at streamlining that. With that, the menu, when you're downsizing it, your labor cost goes down as well because you no longer have to have a whole prep crew that's prepping all these food items for an entire book of menu when you know you can downsize it to the to the selling points and then streamline that profitability there um i think you know so Joe, patrick and, and, and one of the things i just jump in with is you know you talk about the the chains and things like that simplifying their menu but it, from what I've seen, a lot of people just really focus on that kind of the 80-20 rule, right? Where where you've got 80% of your sales coming from essentially 20% of your items. And, you know, I've got clients that have just really trimmed down and said, look, we're only going to have those 20% of the items that are generating our, our revenue. And just like you said, you know, it's it's the rest of it we'll push through specials if we need to. Yeah, yep, absolutely. You know, on the on the beverage side of things, you know, really understanding what you're using, what you're selling is crucial. You know, very often the back bar is loaded with product, right? And and you know, we I like to look at it as professionally. I like to look at it as liquid cash. You know, if you're losing any money behind your bar or in your in your back of the house, that's that's your profit. So 
you know, maybe think about being creative and, and having your staff sell it off, you know, instead of the happy hour items that are your main staple items, start utilizing the items that aren't going to sell. Maybe do a, a, if there's a bourbon that's been sitting there for the last year, do a barrel aged or do a um, peg, uh, you know, infusion and sell it. You know, the guests like these creative things, but you'll actually get it out of there, you know, and, and, and you'll actually make profits off of something that's just sitting there on your shelf. That's uh, you know that's a uh, that's a great point and and for for me I've pointed out with some of our clients that we consult with you know that exact thing where those are dollars sitting on you know on the shelf and and wouldn't they rather have had those dollars sitting in their bank account you know during shutdown times or different things like that um, seeing a lot of creativity with you know flights you talked about bourbon so I've got a, a client that that has a pretty extensive list but they they're doing some some really unique things with flights and you know most jurisdictions that I know and in, in the states that I'm uh, oversee and and have contact with uh, they've gotten really creative and in the legislative uh, bodies have gotten friendlier in terms of to-go items um, you know I've got one client here locally that that literally has a uh, you know like mason jars with with just a top on it with to-go uh, you know drinks you know their craft cocktails and different things like that so um, yeah it's it's really about uh, getting creative. Excellent. Yes, yeah, so we, uh, if there's no uh, comments or questions there, we can move on to, uh, you know, restructuring a to-go station to, to simplify, you know, how your guest experience can be on your to-go um, level of service, uh, which is interesting with the kitchen background too. You'd be shocked how, 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 it can really, you know, a to-go volume that increases can really cripple the guest experience of sitting and dining because of ticket times. You know, so this is one of the things that we're going to talk about. But you know, essentially on the to-go station is, or just accessibility and finding ways to um, upsell and get more product out your door without just the standard seating is, you know, finding that balance, making it more uh, efficient. You know, find you know find your space for it, especially because, you know, I don't know if you've seen some of these uh, franchise restaurants out there like Chipotle. I'm sure everybody's gone into a Moe's or a Chipotle of some sort. Um, these to-go uh, quick service concepts, they've actually restructured their entire uh, kitchen. Uh, partly, you know, the the reason why is because if you have your same staff preparing all the food that's on the line and all these you know the new the the new uber apps and uh, doordash you know the influx of volume there is huge if so what they're doing is actually giving the entire own station in the kitchen to facilitate these orders um, in fact i recommend dedicating um whether it be customer service oriented people, people on the phone, you know, staff in the kitchen, maybe finding the prep area in the back where they can prepare these foods to go um, without disrupting the normal, your, your normal guest experience. Uh, because now you wanna actually influence the way of doing business to make more money. So if you can create an environment where you can do quick service, you know, out of your your restaurant without um, you know crippling your 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 ticket times, that's going to be huge. You know, uh, all the time you're going to see this, but this is the opportunity right now to really really capitalize it. We want to think about a few things too. Is um, looking at what the uh, you know to go containers look like, right? So very often, you know, if you're inside your establishment, a to-go container is different than maybe the experience when you're ordering to-go and you're getting that. What, what do you think, Joe, on that? 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's like even, you know, the slide that we're looking at here and it's got the the nice paper, you know, bag with the with the handle and things like that. There's one thing to go home with something like that or or have an Uber Eats drop it off versus, you know, just your regular plastic bag from your supermarket. I mean, there's it's a very different experience and I think that people really need to understand that the experience doesn't, especially now that we're in the to go era, it doesn't end with the customer walking out the door or sometimes the customer never even comes to the location. So what do they really want to, you know, to remember that food by, you know, and, and are they, are they just putting everything all together or are they separating it out and, you know, so that, you know, things don't get soggy, different things like that, 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 you know, obviously have to be considered now. And, you know, a couple of things that you brought up, Patrick, that I think is really key is I've seen that firsthand where a guest experience has suffered, you know, as me as a customer, and I'm told, well, our kitchen's overwhelmed because of all the to-go orders. Well, it's a good problem to have, but it's also something to, to keep in mind to, to, uh, to solve. Um, you know, I've seen, you know, also uh, just the influx, especially during, say, you know, dinner times and different things like that. You've got all the, the Uber Eats drivers and, and things like that coming in. And you you almost have to have a staging area just for those folks is that they're kind of going to one side um, and, and waiting away from the rest of your guests so that that isn't impacting in a negative fashion as well. Yeah, that's great. You know, society now, it seems like we are all about convenience, right? So, you know, in a in a restaurant, as you're, you know, allowing these, uh, you know, delivery style uh, services, it's creating convenience, whether you're creating it within your, your establishment where you're doing delivery uh, and those such, or you're having where, you know, the Uber Eats and the DoorDash just come and pick up your food. It's really creating a whole new streamline of revenue that the restaurants haven't seen. Uh, well, they've seen a little bit of it, let's say 2017 and on, but now it's very, very, very structured to where uh, if I'm at my house and I want to spend time, you know, sitting and watching TV, I'd much rather do that and, and be with my family in an environment where I can have the same hot, um, tasty food from my local favorite restaurants rather than having to <coughs> sit in a um, 30 to 45 minute, uh, you know, waiting line in order to get uh, to get sat, especially now right. when certain restaurants are only allowing certain capacities. This is huge because you essentially could actually have full capacity um, or more capacity without seating everybody because you're you're flying food out your door for takeout. So convenience. <laughs> And to that point, I've seen, you know, a, uh, granted, we're talking to people all over the country, so there's a lot of different restrictions and different levels of lockdowns, and I understand that. But at the same time, I've seen seen revenue um, actually exceed last year uh, for some clients because they've they've absolutely nailed this part of it to where their to go is is making up for the the lack of. Uh, seats uh, that are occupied because of, uh, you know, restrictions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess, you know, to to make a little bit of note there is just, you know, think about too, you know, if there's so much business being, you know, sent out to these third parties where people are coming up and and picking up the food and delivering it, perhaps looking at creating your own delivery program. Uh, now, there's probably liabilities there for sure on the driving aspect, but you know, if, you're, if the specific companies are, are charging 30% of your, you know, your, what the sale is for that item, it may be advantageous to look at uh, structuring uh, your staff that can, now that maybe got fur furloughed, to then start delivering food on your behalf in your restaurant or bar uh, that could just uh, increase the margins because you're not spending so much on, on the third-party apps. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think we can go to the next uh, the next one on staffing and retraining. Perfect. Yeah, so you know, this is another another key. You know, staffing is is always such a challenge. You know, even even pre COVID, it was a challenge to find you know the right people and have the you know people fully trained and things like that. Um, you know, some of the some of the unfortunate reality is is that um, the staffing is is going to be very different when places are are reopening. Um, people are going to need to be basically retrained a lot of times, or you're going to have a whole new influx of staff that, you know, unfortunately you weren't able to to keep on uh, during the furloughs. And so, you know, I think that one of the keys here, if I would speak to it, is just that really focused training and uh, in even retraining, even those, the you know, the bartenders or the, the kitchen staff that you had had for years, um, you know, unfortunately with a, with a few months off uh, or more uh, can pick up bad habits from, from even just pouring their own drinks at home certainly is a different, uh, different experience than, than at the bar. Um, you know, some of the stuff that I see also is really the need to cross train the staff. Uh, there's, you know, most places, if the volume isn't there, uh, people are wearing a lot of new hats and different hats uh, that they haven't worn before. Um, I've got an example here uh, in the Midwest where I had a, a fairly large uh, group that was coming into town uh, pre-COVID. They had done all their hiring. Uh, they were they were slated to open uh, right as the shutdowns happened. Uh, they had projected and they had hired for approximately 30 in terms of management, full-time management people. Uh, they brought back when they were able to actually open less than half of that. So, you know, when that happens, it's not like that uh, that banquet manager uh, goes away and, and, you know, there's no banquet. So obviously they're very different now with, with different restrictions and sizes, but somebody else has to fill that role. And it might be somebody that's never done that before, never has had that, that level of, you know, planning and execution to, to keep that calendar and, and keep the, you know, the staff, uh, moving where they need to move. Um, anything that you have on this one, uh, Patrick? Yeah, you know, I really believe uh, cross training is key. In fact, even pre-COVID, I've always been very, very big on cross training. Um, you know, one of the things is, is believe it or not, um, it, it, when you really get to know your staff and you uh, create a culture within your staff, um, you know, don't just be a boss, you know, be a friend, understand, you know, their uh, goals within this, you know, in the hospitality industry, you know, cross training, believe it or not, can take someone from, you know, one skill set to the another, to another, and, and not even realizing that as an owner, how much influence that you've made on that individual. You know, um, if you think about it, you know, if you have a prep cook or a dishwasher, and that's what they come in to do, you know. I, I, I know it, I saw it firsthand where, yes, we have great dishwashers and we have great prep cooks, but if the dishwasher, you know, is sitting there and, you know, they're on their headphones and they're playing, you know, whatever, they're just hanging out in a dish area, um, you know, have them start learning a skill on the prep level. Believe it or not, you know, I, from my experience, <clears throat> they're some of the best prep team members that you'll ever have. And then they've created a new skill level. And as you do that, you're bringing them up in the industry and changing their lives and their family lives. And I'm really big on that because, you know, I came from a background where I remember that if you wanted to be the grill cook, you know, if that guy takes a day off, you better be ready to jump on the grill and, and be able to be prepared to do that. So nowadays, I think it's a little different. It's, it's, it's not so uh, aggressive. I think moving people around in stations in the traditional kitchen, whether it's the fry station or the saute station or the grill station can only benefit on all levels. You know, if someone needs a day off and we know this, right? Staffing's huge. When someone gets sick mm -hmm. 
and you've only trained one guy on the saute station, you know, your, your, your restaurant is crippled at that point, you know? <clears throat> and so instead of hiring two saute chefs or two, two saute cooks and, and one only getting three days a week and the other one getting X amount of shifts, you know, depending on, you know, lunch or dinner, you know, having the guy that runs the fry station knowing how to saute is great because, you know, now you can stagger in times. If you're not busy from four to six, let's just say, then there's no reason why you need the the, the grill cook there, the, the saute cook and the fry cook there all at the same time when someone can do the rest of the job. Um, <clears throat> and believe it or not, the skills that you're going to, you know, help those individuals with will be good. I even think of it as the front of the house, back of the house thing. There's always been, from my experience, this little barrier line between front of the house and back of the house. Well, you know, I, I've always believed in breaking that barrier and having the front of the house do some of the work of the back of the house and vice versa. Um, you know, when I worked for Darden, opening concepts for them years ago, it was interesting because utilizing the manager's skill level was one of the most focal points where if you're a, a chef in the kitchen and you're opening that kitchen, there's no reason why you can't open up the front of the house and get the entire front of the house staff up and running there, you know, instead of having a front of the house manager and a back of the house manager there at the same time, you know, stagger them in, <clears throat> then you you essentially can, you know, uh, you have less payroll and, and more efficiency throughout your whole entire establishment. You know, and the only the thing that I would piggyback onto there, and and I think you nailed it, that uh, I think is is so often overlooked, is what you're doing to that for that person, for their future. I mean, when you're tapping into that, uh, the the dishwasher and, and putting them into prep and cross training them, I mean, you're, you're showing that you believe in that person. And a lot of times, you know, you've had it to where that's the, that's the spark that inspires them to carry forward and have years in the hospitality business and, and maybe even, you know, have their own place. It, it, there's every owner that, uh, that I've ever spoke to has a story like that where somebody thought, Hey, you know what, this person is, is being underutilized and I'm going to help them out. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. You know, <clears throat> it's a culture, you know, and I, I believe that if, if, if there's, or let's just take it this way. If, as long as the bar staff is giving really, really good customer service and, and being able to be attentive, I'd rather have, you know, one or two bar staff making more money than having three or four there where nobody's making enough money. So same thing in the back of the house. Sure. If, if someone could do multiple jobs and be okay, I would rather pay them an extra $2 an hour than paying an, an entire another staff member um, $15 an hour for that matter when I can pay someone else to be successful in what they're really, you know, wanting to do. So I also look at, uh, you know, the not only the skill level, but the eagerness to be there and wanting to be there, and you know, the hard working. I think that's I think that's super important to realize because um, your your staff as well is the number one source to well, not number one source I would say, but marketing your staff is going to market your venue right so you want to make them happy right. you don't want your your staff to promote and bring people in there's no doubt about that and, and when they're having a great day on the job then you're having a great day you know making money i can guarantee that absolutely and just think where you're positioning yourself um once the restrictions are are off and and things are back at full capacity and things like that, at least if you're taking away one nugget, you know, you, to me, okay, we're all in challenging times. What can we take away that's positive? And if we can take away a better structure uh, for our, our 
our business or a better culture, the things that you're talking about, uh, those are wins. Those are wins that, that wouldn't have happened unless we have these, these challenging things going on. Yeah, absolutely agree. Yeah, I think, uh, I think moving into a, uh, the technology piece would be good too. Yeah, so, so on the next one, adopting new technology, you know, this we could probably, when Patrick and I were talking about this, we could probably spend the, an entire uh, webinar just on this. So we're just going to kind of hit some highlights. But the thing that I would say on this, you know, we, we're talking about time management, inventory, online ordering, and, you know, recipe management uh, as, our, as our highlights. But the thing that I'll say about this is that the technology isn't going away. It's only coming faster and, and there's going to be more of it. You know, if you think about, you know, QR codes at the table and, and things like that, those aren't going to go away as restrictions go away. Um, the only thing that I that I would say on that, though, is that as the restrictions go away and maybe your demographics start to change about who's coming into uh, into the to, to your your establishment, think about you know um, if if they're not used to that. Maybe they're staying home right now because they don't want to get out and you know be exposed to to a lot of people. But but uh, I would say it's going to have to be a healthy balance uh, once the restrictions are off to be able to go. Okay, we've got these new things, but now we've got this whole new batch of customers that aren't used to you qr codes right now and and things like that um patrick what i mean what are you seeing you're you're heavy on the kitchen side what are you seeing in terms of like the restaurant or the recipe management and things like that so yeah i mean th there's so much technology uh, one one of the things just in general for like you mentioned online ordering and um contactless ordering and these type of things. I mean, the sponsor, Hunger Rush, they, they essentially have a great platform to provide for, for that. that. There's no doubt about that. You know, the idea with the POS and being a one-stop shop is great. Um, you know, in the recipe management, this is crucial, you know, um, because if, if you have dishes that you're preparing and or recipes behind the bar that have uncontrolled food costs or cost of goods it can get out of hand pretty 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 quickly so having a recipe management and inventory management program you know i, I could be a little biased but you know sculpture hospitality this is one of our um this is one of our focuses with inventory and financial analysis and recipe management um it, it's it's one of the the key points because you're the in a restaurant, not only if you're in a restaurant that give great customer service and you just love people, but you make money from selling goods and you know services essentially, but those goods have a cost. So if you're selling something at under cost and your margins are not going to be there, and we kind of you know just kind of talking about it in the very first section of this uh, webinar, but if if you're not focusing on what the cost of every item is, you want to rethink that because <clears throat> every item that's put out of the kitchen or behind the bar um, has a cost that you've just spent your money on. So as you spend money, the goal is to make money, you know, and that's why everybody's pretty much in business. The number one way of evaluating that is through inventory management and recipe management. Um, I, you know, it, I couldn't stress that enough because then, of course, you need a great POS system in order to deliver, you know, a product quick enough to the kitchen and understand it, quick online ordering, those type of things. It's it's very, very, very important. Yeah, I, I can't uh, can't disagree with you. And, you know, I've I've uh, given a number of my clients. Um, talk about dead stock and, and refer them to uh, blog articles that we we've posted through Sculpture Hospitality or you know 
generating reports for them that will help them uh, identify, you know, things that haven't moved for months and, and what can they do with specials on that and, you know, start to turn those, uh, you know, that dead stock into actual dollars that they need to operate. Yeah, I'll give you one of the largest things that I, one of the, I mean, pronounced thing that in, when I go into a restaurant that happens or a bar for that matter, hotel, <clears throat> When it comes to setting up um, their inventory management um, or their recipe management, is the generic mod keys, right? Believe it or not, no one realizes how much money they're losing with generic mod keys. And I'll give you an example by that. So, if if you're drinking, um, you know, Macallan 30, very expensive stuff. Right. So if you're drinking Macallan 30 and <clears throat> let's just say it's, uh, you know, $50 a, a drink, you know, or $25 a drink for what, whatever the price may be, and you hit a rocks key, okay? 98% mm -hmm. of the clients that we go into has a generic $2 or $4 key. Um, for the rocks. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, for the rocks or the double or uh, an upcharge. So they call them upcharges. Really look at when it comes to inventory management and recipe management, look at those costs. Because when you have someone that realizes that they can come in and drink a, a larger size pour uh, for a very, very discounted price, they're going to do it all day long. So you don't really do that in the kitchen. You never see that in the kitchen. You don't ever see a generic button. Um, you know, if you have an upcharge for steak, you're upcharging steak accordingly to what the cost would be, right? That's a really good point. Yeah, so it's going to mesh in. So if you if you get a Caesar salad and add steak, it'd basically be like you're getting a steak salad, right? So the costing around that is derived because there's there's a reason for a theoretical number versus an actual. So, but behind the bar, we see all the time where you're ringing in a Tito's and you ring in rocks and and it's the same price as if you were to ring in a well drink and hit rocks for $2. So think about that when you reopen or if you're already open, look at your inventory management program, look at your POS systems and see if, if when it's set up, it's itemized enough for you to capture more profit accordingly to a theoretical and actual food cost or beverage cost. Uh, that's that's one of the biggest things that I would say. I think that's a that's a great nugget to kind of leave us off at. I like that. Yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, technology is huge. Um, some are great, some are not great. You know. Um, but there's there's a reason why it's there and efficiencies are huge. So if you can utilize technology, I mean, <clears throat> I can tell you, I would never, in fact, I go in and I see people using, uh, not people, but like restaurants and bars, their, their staff doing inventory on a pen and paper. Um, that's so time consuming. <laughs> there's so many, sure. there's so, many, so many tools out there. Um, that would be, well, I think Waffle House still does it, believe it or not. Waffle House still takes every order on a pad and paper, right? I mean, that that works for them because it's quick service and, and what, what have you. But, I mean, with new technology, I, I'm sure that that could be more streamlined with just ordering right at the table, like you said, with online ordering in the apps. Um, so that's pretty much all I have. I mean, I would love to hear some comments or any questions that anybody has or um, anything that um, we can help with or any questions. Yes, absolutely. Thank you guys so much for that amazing presentation. Sure, sure. Um, to all of our, our listeners, I understand if you need to run, but just remember that we've been recording this session, so it will be available for you to watch on our site within the next 48 hours. Um, we'll also be sending out a survey when you log off, so help us make our webinars better and fill that out. So, 
um, to dive into some questions here. We've got one from Celeste, and she's asking, how do you see best in class in addressing alcohol beverage sales with to-go? I think a lot of that, uh, from my perspective, is based on the local jurisdictions and, and, and things like that. Um, you know, most places, most markets that I'm involved in now has to go, uh, but it's it's very specific uh, and situational as well. You know, I, I mentioned the the place that uh, that I've got that has a you know a mason jar that they can go you know to go. I've got places that have styrofoam cups that's that's not attractive, but they do. And so at the same time. Um, there's some other markets that I'm very aware of out there that it's very strict in terms of um, a single serve and it's, you know, um, you know, how are you packaging it, that it needs to be in like a sealed bag or, you know, different things like that. I think you can still get, um, you can still present a brand, you can still present an image, you know, do you want a, a a bag that goes out that has a sealed top or do you want that styrofoam cup um, you know same thing with do you want your logo on it do you want to drop in a you know a uh, a coupon let's say for you know a dollar off you know on your next to go drink uh, things like that to bring people back as well I'm not sure if that it Patrick do you have anything to add to that yeah, actually, <clears throat> so I'm seeing it quite often in, in, in the Florida market, and a lot of them are, uh, a lot of the clients are doing it very, very well, actually. So um, many of them are getting uh, logoed cups, and they have the little seal machine. Of the kind of, If you've ever been to a boba tea place, um, they seal the top of the drink. Well, you can get that machine very, very uh, inexpensive, and what we're seeing is there's giving the nice sleek glass with logos and then what they're doing essentially they're, they're it's call, calling like a you know cocktail on the go for your to go process but um you would want to make sure you let them know um that it's better to serve it without ice and here's the reason why you don't want to condone them taking it in the car or popping a straw in there and drinking the cocktail so what we're finding is that the item would have a receipt, would be sealed, and it would be able to be taken home, opened up, and ice added. Um, and or, uh, let's say the Mexican restaurants are solely focusing on two or three to-go margaritas, um, or their specialty cocktails specifically to-go, or full bottles of wine, or bottles of beer. Um, I believe or i do see that it's possible that this is gonna this is gonna go away though um once uh the pandemic is no longer around yeah and i think that that's yeah. here locally i know our restaurant association is really uh a champion for continuing that so i think that that's where you know it's going to matter is getting involved in the in the grassroots local level to to have your local legislators take a look at, at how they can continue to, to move this one along. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for answering that, guys. Um, this next one we have is from Kathleen, and she's just asking uh, for tips for planning staff more efficiently. Patrick, you wanna go with that? Yeah, I would say um, if you go back to looking at um, cross-training your staff, um, this is this is big, but planning to um, you know staff them. I would say definitely make sure you're finding out the hours of operation and how many how many team members you need to facilitate a smooth operation during all of those uh, times. And there's many staffing um, softwares out there that you can you can utilize from the technology piece and you can plug those hours of operations in and, and how busy you think you're going to be and it kind of will generate how many uh, people you'll need per shift and that's another uh, thing going back to preparing and planning is really understanding the performa of your business 
how many staff members you need to to facilitate that business is going to be big. So I would say just really laying out hours of operation. Think about if you need a person on the grill station here, how many how many tables per server are you going to need? Um, then you can look at you know the new technology with the QR codes and ordering online that uh, Hunger Rush has. Essentially, is is maybe you're not going to need as many servers as you will if they're going to order things right from the table. Um, so it's really just understanding the time matrix and and how many stations you need to fulfill during the day. All right, excellent. Question is from Kevin. And he says, while I love the idea of cross-training employees, how do you recommend keeping morale when you're cutting staff at the same time? That one is the 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 uh, the challenge for sure. And I think that that really, you know, it's it's about being upfront with with everybody in terms of look, this is where we're at. Um, the, you know, a lot of things are out of your control in terms of the mandates are coming down and they're they're coming fast and furious and and you just have to react unfortunately i think that the you'd be surprised at when you're involved in the cross training and people are people are coming to work the one the staff that you do have and they're learning new things um uh, it 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 motivates them to come into work and they're excited to learn something new and they're going to be you know more receptive to you know th the understanding that the challenges in terms of the hours and, and things like that that are available might change but they're being challenged in other ways um, that's that's where i would go with that patrick yeah um this is a hard decision uh, on every owner for sure um, and there's so many things that are out of your control sometimes that if the volume does not present itself to lend yourself to have enough payroll um, you know on on it's it's you'll have to really look at those uh, individuals that are loyal um, willing to show up on time and really begin to value those attributes and um, hope that you can encourage those that stay on with you and work hard that it's it would become a morale boost that you know because very often we work around people that don't pull their weight and that's that's reality of it so it could help engage the morale within your establishment by you know, sometimes having to make those hard decisions um, with the ones that aren't, uh, and sometimes that encourages, will encourage your staff. All right, yeah, absolutely. The more stock you put in your people, the more they're gonna rise to the occasion, for sure. Um, all right, well, uh, it looks like that's all the questions we have for today. Um, I just wanna thank our guests, Patrick and Joe, I want to thank our sponsor, Hunger Rush, and of course, all of you for attending. Um, my name is Julie, and you can find Restaurateur Connection on Twitter at Restaurateur underscore capital C. Thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Julie, thank you.